Okay, so good morning, and uh, we are studying through a series of questions um, that various people are bringing against Jesus. He's uh, in the temple grounds, and it's the week where he's going to be crucified, and the questions have been sort of a barrage of attacks against him, and it started out with uh, chapter 11 in the book, uh, Gospel of Mark, verse 28. And it was really, who gives you authority to do these things? Because the day prior, he cleansed the temple, you know, threw over the money changers' tables and so forth. So they're like, who gives you the right to be in here and do this? And uh, he gave them the parable of the, the vine dressers. <clears throat> Quite an amazing parable. And uh, what is the source of authority? Uh, the authority for decisions and actions that we do. And do we act as though uh, we are our own authority? Or do we believe that God has the ultimate authority? And then in chapter 12, verse 14, a second question comes to him, and it's posed as a, um, a political trap, really. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Not an honest question. It was a question to bring a divisive uh, end, you know, and to put Jesus on what was called, the, you know, the horns of an altar. Either side, you're going to be impaled. It's a lose-lose question. But Jesus, once again, he answers with such, um, such wisdom and authority and he doesn't dodge the question he actually directly answers the question and so um yes we're to honor government but uh god has the higher authority and so give those things which belong to the government the governments and give those things which belong to god god and to god so the third question was in chapter 12 verse 23 and it says in the resurrection you know, it's a question about the resurrection, and the Sadducees posed that question. It was a different group every time. Sadducees posed it, and they don't believe in a resurrection. So it's a doctrinal sort of uh, debate, and they think they have a really good reason not to believe in it and pose this so, s seemingly impossible question. And uh, it wasn't impossible because absolutely, yes, there is a resurrection by all means. And um, the, the soul is immortal. And then... Now we are finally at the fourth question here in chapter 12, and it's going to pick it up in verse 28. And uh, before Angela comes up and, and reads the text for us, I just want to share with you about uh, this question. It's, it's a question that's addressed to Jesus from a single scribe, and he, he was sent sort of from the group of scribes. What are scribes? They're the lawyers. They're the, the uh, ones who interpret the law. They spend their whole life studying it. And um, the question isn't about the authority of God or political Rome this or taxes that or resurrection. It's not about those things. It really just takes such a different angle. It assumes, yeah, God is in authority. And, and so what is his command toward us? We, we're under him and he's in charge of our lives. What, what does God desire of us? And I think it's really the most pertinent question for us. Out of all these other questions there, these other questions maybe, they, they definitely have application, but I think this one's the most pertinent. I think it's the, the one that's the most real, if you will. What is, and, and the question really is, I'll rephrase it, what is the overall most important command from God? What is the overall most important command from God? You know, God has graciously allowed us to live. He's given us an intellect, he's given us emotions, he's given us a heart, he's given us a body, a soul, etc. He's given us strength to live with. What do we do with it all? What does God desire that we do with it all? And what is, what is most important to God uh, with, with my, regards to my life? What does he want from the life that he has given me on loan? You know, and, and what is it we will do with our lives? What rule will we live by at the end of the day? What, what governs how we live? Is there an overarching law of your whole life that governs why you do what you do and how you live and so forth? How we use our mind, how we use our soul and our bodies. Is there an overarching law over it all? Interesting question, isn't it? I think it's very pertinent. And no doubt at some point in everyone's life, in one of these areas, at least, you're going to be very broken. Your heart will be broken. Your soul may be broken. Your body, it's going to be broken if it's not already. Uh, you know, like, your, your life, there's brokenness in all these areas. And, and people have different areas in which they have felt a primary brokenness in their life, right? 
Maybe for one person, it's their soul. You know, there's a tragic situation my wife and I are aware of in the city, and it's, it's a young girl. And this girl's soul is just going to be broken because of the situation she's in. And, and maybe it's someone else, it's later, it's, man, their body. It's just, it's broken, and it affects the soul, and it affects everything else. It's, you know, I, I've been thinking more about some of these things in the worship of God, that word holistically, <laughs> You know, not just as a, as a secular, you know, like health food store word, but like a word biblically that when we look at this, how God desires that we would love him holistically, really with our whole life. So this last question doesn't present uh, something that's like, here's what I am going to do with my life and does God approve or not? It's, it's not a question that is asking God to prove himself to us like the other questions. Who should we obey? You know, it's th- these other questions were, were antagonistic in nature against God. This fourth question in this series of questions, barrage of questions, isn't like that. This fourth question is, what does God want from me? It's asking from a totally different angle. Do you see that? What, rather than, here's what I am going to do, and, and it's up to God to prove himself, it's a question that says, what should I do with the life I have? It comes from a position of humility instead. And have you ever asked Jesus, what do you want me to do with my life? What would you like me to do with my heart, Jesus? What about when something happens to you, it hits? What do you want me to do with this situation, my soul? What do you want me to do with my body now, the life I have? So, uh, Angela, if you'd come up and read the text, please, it'd be great. Just give it yeah, one push there. And it's Mark 12, verse 28 to 34. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any question. Thanks, Angela. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time we get to study this text, and we thank you for this question that was asked of you. And we thank you for the answer you gave, Lord, and we ask that you'd impact our lives today with it, and we ask that you'd minister to us more of the love of God, because we need it, Lord, and we desire it. And so, God, wherever we're at in our lives, we want to free up our hearts this morning, and we want to say, would you pour into them, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, the perfect law of liberty, which is love, would you pour into us that fruit of your spirit and, uh, and help us where we need this help, Lord. So God, I'm asking for myself, I'm asking for everyone here that you would fill us with more of the love of God for you so that we can love you with that love, Lord. And uh, just minister to us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So here is an honest scribe, it seems like, right? He, he's got this honest question, and um, he, I, I think that when he, he's only also in Matthew's, Matthew's account, this account right here, and when you read Matthew's account, it seems like uh, a little more positioned as though he's part of the bigger group, it doesn't mention the individual, and it seems a little bit more like he was meant to uh, bring an accusation like the previous questions, but Mark really personalizes it and, and shows us that uh, this, this scribe here particularly, he was waiting for the opportunity to come and talk to Jesus directly. And as soon as he saw it, he listened. He was standing by. He was listening to these arguments, listening to the other arguments, listening to the argument about the Sadducees and the resurrection. And he was blown away. 
You get that real impression when you read the verb tenses and so forth. And he was waiting, listening, present, and then boom. As soon as he saw that opportunity, he went and he approached Jesus. He says, teacher, you know, and he asks him a question. Actually, he doesn't approach with any fanfare we saw previously. They were approaching him with, uh, we, we know you're a man from God and all this, you know, feigned uh, honor. But he just approaches with the question. And then later he's actually going to say, teacher, you, you've said well. You know, so it seems to be a much more honest man that comes to him. And, uh, and the other ones weren't friendly, so to speak. But this seems to be sincere. Now he's a lawyer, or was what Matthew says, or a scribe in the Gospel of Mark, this man that approaches him. In other words, he's a professional. His, his life has been spent studying the law of God. It's been spent studying the, the covenant of uh, the old covenant of Moses and so forth. So it's been studying that. And what does God want of mankind? And so when Israel would, would have to ask, well, was this, did they break the law of the Sabbath or not? You know, these, these are the guys, the scribes, that are the ones that define whether or not someone had broken a law and what exactly that meant and so forth. Well, he was intently listening. And, um, and he, he wants to know the bigger picture, clearly. You know, as, as soon as he comes up, uh, he... He wants to know this great question. I think it's, it's the best question. I think it's an excellent question. And really, he already began, began with, God has the authority, of course, right? And, and here's a response that man is to have. Because God is. And here's the response, right? What should man do? It's, it's not putting these questions, attacking Jesus. He wants to hear because Jesus has answered so well on these other questions. Which is the first command, he says in verse 28? Which is the first? First is, is more than number. It's not, you know, there's one command, which is number two command. What's number three command and number four and so forth? It's not like that. It's not, it's much more complex question than that in the sense that it's the first command of all or more literally reading what sort of commandment is first of all? What sort of commandment? It's a it's like more of a categorizing question uh, in the sense that he already had his own assessment, I believe, because that's why he said, you said well. But he wanted to hear what Jesus would say without this malicious intent. It's, but it is a test. Matthew says he tested him. It's a test of Jesus' skill. Does Jesus know of all the commands, what is the greatest command of all? What would he say to that? See, the rabbis counted 613 different commandments 365 negative hey that's easy to remember with our calendar right there's a negative commandment for every day in the of the year and that's the way most people think about god just they just oh man it's so overbearing how can i please this god you know his negative command don't 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 one for every one don't for every day of the year and then um that's how some kids feel right <laughs> uh and then it's only 248 for positive on the positive side of it but, you know, the comparative importance between these 613 commands was debated, highly debated. Oh, which one, you know? Which one of the don'ts was the most important, you know? Which one of the do's was the most important? It's highly debated which was, which was the most important there. So, which had the principle over all, which was above the rest, it's a classification or categorization sort of question in the sense that what kind of command ranked in the highest place? You, know, you can go into a bookstore and there's tons of books, but what book is above all the books? You know, like what's the name of the store and so forth? What, what quality made a commandment the first place above all the commandments? Amazing question, really. It's such an amazing question. The scribe could tell Jesus was not your average theologian. He taught as one having authority and wisdom. He taught so differently than everyone else. He spoke, and no one could have gone through the gauntlet of questions and scrutiny that Jesus went through. But Jesus did, and he came out somehow glowing. He came out with these other people totally confounded every time. It's, inc it's incredible. That's the one reason I don't think this man's totally malicious either, is because he didn't come out confounded. He comes out agreeing. Yeah, you're right. Possibly warmed in his heart that Jesus answered it like he did. Because he's debated with his friends over this question. He's, he's been around the circles long enough. He was poised to ask the question from the scribes, the group of scribes, that, hey, you're number four up to bat, right? 
The fourth batter is supposed to hit a home run, by the way. It brings everybody in. He's number four thought, and, and what does he do? He asks this question. Maybe he changed it on the way. I don't know, but he seems different than the rest, and he wants to know what Jesus would say as the overarching law of God for man, because I believe this man did have a fear of God and did want to know himself. What is that overarching law of God? What would Jesus say to that? Because his questions are above the rest. What law is above the rest? What is the first commandment? And Jesus, who knows, by the way, (laughs) gives the answer to this excellent question, to the best question. And in verse 29, Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. It's amazing. The first commandment involves both this uh, it involves several, several scriptures, but it begins with the sh- what's called the Shema, or Shema, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's a prayer, and it means hear. Okay, the, you just use the first word, so Genesis, beginning, right? Uh, Deuteronomy, law, or, and, and this is Shema, so hear is the name of the prayer, and it's Numbers 15, it's in Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11. This is the first commandment. It's a bunch of, it's a, several things put together, and he says this is the first it's not just love God. It's the first of all is hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one and love him. That's the first. That's not the first 1A and 1B or, or 1 and 2. And the third is love your neighbor. The first is the Lord is one, love him. That's the first. Interesting. So every religious Jew, by the way, would pray this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, morning and evening in their worship to God. It's a religious creed or a confession of faith. It was a prayer that they would pray morning and evening. So hear, O Israel, or behold, O Israel. Listen, Israel. Israel, listen. Don't listen to the noise of the world. Don't listen to the, all the things that people are saying out there. Listen to the voice of God. The Lord is one. It's not many gods it's not there's no God. It's not you made yourself. It's not that the, the cosmos suddenly birthed, you know, life, you know, miraculously. No, God is one. God is the creator. Listen to that. And, and it's not just true for Israel. It's true for the world, over all, for all the cosmos. I was reading in my devotions in Isaiah uh, recently, and I came across this great verse, Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. I thought, what an incredible scripture. What about those, those people that claim to have seen or heard these other things? Well, they haven't heard or seen from a God because there is no other God. Maybe a spirit, maybe a demon, maybe, you know, there's something in their own mind or the mess that's there. But they haven't heard from another God because they can't. It's impossible. How could you hear from another God when there is no other God? How could you perceive? And perceive is, is the idea of becoming consciously aware. Consciously aware. And no one has ever seen any God besides him. You know, people, again, they could have heard from some, some, something that's a deception, something else, but you can't hear from another God. He is the eternal, ever-existent I am. He's self-existent. There has to be a cause at the beginning of the universe. Matter cannot create more matter, creating more, and then it doesn't work. There has to be a cause. Has to be a cause. This is simple science. He is the uncaused cause. He's the ever self-existent, eternal God. The uncaused cause at the beginning of all. And without him was nothing made that was made, John 1 says. In him was life. Life was the light of men. Life comes from him alone. He's the unchanging covenant God. The Lord is one, the unchanging covenant God. He's the Alpha Omega, beginning and the end, right? First and the last. Besides him, there is no God. And whether a person is Jewish or Hungarian or Australian or Asian or First Nations or Mexican, it does not matter. There is one God. That's all there is. There's one God. Over all the earth, and besides him, there is no other. There's no other. The, the word for Lord there is, is capitals in many of your Bibles. should be in all the Bibles, L-O-R-D. It's the Hebrew tetragram, Y-H-W-H. 
which a scholar like David Hawking could <laughs> teach about the tetragram and how important and amazing it is for easily an hour. But there's just one God. Never has there been, nor will there ever be another. So the devil's first lie, you shall be as God. You know, no, not going to happen. The Mormons believe there's plethora of gods and the men get to become gods and women sucks for you. You get to have babies forever. And, you know, and if, if you're not married to a good Mormon man, you better, better marry a dead one. <laughs> it's, it's insane. Um, you know, like there's many gods and all these things. And, and there's one God. Neither you nor I are God. <laughs> That's pretty plain, should be plain, uh, which means we should not worship or bow down our will to ourselves at all. A person either has the Lord as his God or they have a false God. Think about this. If you don't believe there's a God, just say for a moment, yes, okay, for sake of our, there's a God. Well, then either you bow down to God, who is one, there's one God, or anything else you ever, whatever or whoever it may be that you bow down to or worship, that's a false God, right? People who will not look to God by default will make something or someone into their God of worship. Everybody will worship. The atheist says, I don't worship. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Everybody worships. The soul worships. It's what it does. It, you will worship. The mind worships. Everyone worships. That person, that spirit, or that hypothesis, <laughs> or thing, or whatever it is, it's less than God, and therefore it's an idol, or a false God, right? And it's, it's a God of one's own making. And anything that's not looked to, uh, everything that is looked to that's not God, is an idol, by default. It's an idol. And our society is full of idolatry. Yeah, there's little statues in, on the you know, rise in our city, right? Coombs Market, etc. There's little statues, people, but that's not what I'm talking about. Our society, the Western culture is full of idolatry, things people bow down to with the heart, you know? It's idolatry, something that is created, that, that man is, is looking to an attempt to fill their soul, to fill their life, to find their strength, to warm their hearts, to find some healing for brokenness, to find some, I don't know, something to meditate on with our minds. It may be wealth, it may be image, it may be power, it may be pleasure, whatever it is. But when someone holds any kind of creed or belief system, they're sort of bowing down their intellect to that. Think about it. I believe this. You're bowing your intellect to that, aren't you? When you believe something and you're holding that creed, an atheist, for example, I believe this, and they set out the reasons why. By the way, there's a manifesto and a creed. If you, can, you can look it up online if you want to. Agnostics, atheists, whatever. And if they've got a creed, it's a belief system. And the belief begins with, I don't believe in God. Imagine that. How can you believe in something that doesn't exist anyways? It's so weird. But <laughs> they, their belief system is based upon that negative. And they bow down their minds to it. And they bow down their wills to a man-created philosophy. That's worshiping something. Everyone has a God because the will will bow down to what one believes in and trusts in. The will bows to that. It's either of their own making, it's, or it's a deception, or it is the true and living God. So Jesus begins, the first of all the commands is, Hear, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. It begins with God. That's where all real wisdom begins. That's why I'm alive. You find that out. It's who I am, because God is. I, I get to know who I am, excuse me. I get to know how I am to live. I get to know what I'm to do with my life. Otherwise, man will not have an answer to origin, to purpose, to uh, meaning in life. Man won't have an answer. It's just shots in the dark. But, but believing that God is, beginning with God, gives you that wisdom. All these questions begin with him. And by the way, the one who has the authority gives the commands. So people like creating their own gods. Because the one with the authority can make the rules. So if you believe in God, then the question is, what is your command? Because he has authority. 
If you don't believe in God, I guess at least theoretically you're off the hook. But what if he exists? <laughs> you're definitely not off the hook, right? You're just suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. The one with the authority gives commands. And people don't want to believe there's any authority over them. So God gives commands. He has the right to. He has the wisdom to. He has the heart to. He gives commands. It's, it begins with this, there is one God. And it's the Lord. It's from the beginning. He's the one at Genesis 1.1. He created the heavens and the earth. You know, it's at the end. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth, redemption of mankind and his creation. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And God can command whatever he wants. Think about this. If God were arbitrary, what would you expect of God's commands? Again, saying someone doesn't believe in God. Say there is a God. Then he can command what he wants, right? Yeah. It's God. He can command what he wants. can do what he wants. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He can do what he wants beyond space and time. Okay. So if he's arbitrary in character, what would you expect from his commands? Irrational commands, I guess. Commands that frustrate mankind, I guess, right? Lack of reason or purpose behind them. If God were vindictive, what do you think his commands would be like? I think they'd probably be harsh, ugly, cruel commands if he were a vindictive by nature. If God was not noble, but he was weak, then his commands would be unjust. And if God was mean, what, his commands wouldn't be, have any mercy in them. If he, was, if he lacked compassion, his commands would not have mercy, right? You could go on and on and, and think about that. Just think about it, you know? There's no way I will believe Allah is, is the one true God. No way. Never go there. You know, there's, there's cruelness. There's ugliness. There's intentional harm. There's no way of knowing in a relational way. There's no life. There's no mercy. There's no, there's no um, compassion. None of those things. God, what does he primarily command? So God is. That's how it begins. The first command. <laughs> you can't believe in God's commands if you don't believe in God. What does he primarily command? Overall, what is the primary uh, request that God makes of mankind, asks of mankind, desires of mankind, commands of mankind? The greatest importance or place in God's heart for mankind is what? For his creation. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second's like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. This, this to me floors me. And I've had a hard time, to be honest with you, wrapping my head around this. And not in the sense that I, I know, yeah, the commands love, and just thinking about the songs we were singing this morning, so many of them including love. I've got a book on my shelf. It's called, I'm sure you'd love to borrow it, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. <laughs> That's the title of the book. <laughs> I haven't read it. But uh, <laughs> like most books on my shelf, just to be, just to clarify. He knows a lot. Look at all the bookshelves. No, don't be fooled. Uh, the difficult doctrine of the love of God. Because you, like, you think, why is God? Why does he love? But if he didn't love, what would it be like? You know, I got to see the bees swirling around my beech tree this morning. I thought maybe there's a wasp nest. No, the honeybees were all over it. Just, wow, that's so incredible. You know, Linda, you're sharing with me about the, the tabby cat coming up from you know, bringing it home and following you and just how wonderful. The world's wonderful. There's amazing things in the world. It's so many miracles, so many amazing, beautiful, wonderful things. God who is love designed it, right? It'd be, it'd be so ugly <laughs> if he wasn't love. I mean, just that this is God's command. I think, wow. In the Mormon theme, I'm just, that's God's command, love? Love is his command. What does your God want? Love. What does he want from me anyhow? Love. Like, oh. It like stops the, all the arguments, by the way. It's just arguments, dead. When you find out that that's, that's the answer. 
His first command isn't to submit to his authority. His first command, I mean, think about it. God could force submission on every, you know, rational being in the universe just instantly. All he would have to do is reveal just a bit of his glory. And every thing that has a conscience, even matter, trees and rocks, organic and non-organic material, is going to bow down and worship him at the presence of, of his glory. So a submission could be an instantly imputed or forced upon all mankind. Everyone would suddenly hurl to their knees in complete and utter irresistible confession and submission to omnipotent, glorious God. But that's not his command. See, love is something that can't be forced. He cannot make anyone love him. He does not make anyone love him. God does not make anyone love him. Love has to come from one's own will. Love, and how can that not appeal to everyone? He could, God could command to do this, command to do that. Think about this. The Bible clearly teaches without love, all your actions don't matter. So he can command you to go do things. So here's overarching law, love. Because if you don't have love in anything else God desires that you do, it's nothing. Husbands should serve their wives. But if they don't do it with love, then <laughs> they failed at that. So yes, serve, but it's got to be love. Love has to overarch everything I do. And then I'm in the will of God. And I'm keeping his command. You see what I'm saying? No matter what it is we're doing, no matter what it is, all those works will count for nothing if they don't have love. And, and what remains at the end? Love. The scribe is going to respond, you said well. You know, well said, teacher. You spoke the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. Amen to that. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength. It repeats all four in verse 33. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is awesome. This man was zealous for the truth. He wanted the answers. There are people who want religion and there are people who want the truth. There are people who want to play the game. There are people who want to go to church. There are people who just want to be, you know, seen as though there's something they're not. And there's people that want to know. And that was my hunger and desire. When I was a teenager, I did not know God at all. I, I wanted to know why. And evolution in my high school science class in Ladner didn't make any sense to me. You know, pleasing myself was all I knew how to do, so I went and I would do that. But meaning to life, answers to life, why I existed, any of those questions. And I believe anyone that's on that track and their desire is to actually know, they've got to come to this conclusion. This, the same one this man is on, he's on that track and now he has such an answer because he's been studying the Bible his whole life. But God will call someone out of total darkness who has that kind of a heart, who hadn't studied the Bible all their life and they get to come to the same conclusion. I get to know the ultimate truth of mankind, that I get to love God. I get to, be a, I get to be a responder first to his love, be filled with his love, by which it leaps back to God and then spreads out to all my fellow man. That is the greatest purpose of, of life. You know, the, the catechism is like, what's the purpose of life? It's to glorify God. No, it's, it's to love. I'm sorry. The greatest command is not to glorify God. I, I do think that's wrong. Glorifying God is, is an absolute result of all those wonderful things of love. It's a result, and it's awesome. God should be glorified. God deserves glory. But his ultimate command isn't to glorify him. He could just put everyone in submission to glorify him, and he'd get what he wants. He wants a relationship with mankind, and, and I do believe it has to come from the free will now. Looking at this, how could you love without that? I can't force anyone in my family to love me. I can't force anyone else to love me. And here's this guy. He's on this track. He's like, it doesn't matter. All the burnt offerings, all the sacrifices, all the stuff we do doesn't matter in this temple. Without love, 
Love is greater than all of that. It's so awesome. This guy gets it. That's why Jesus says to him, he looks at him. You, answer, you know, he saw, he, this is a wise answer. And wisdom begins with knowing God. You are not far from the kingdom of God. No, he's not far at all from the kingdom of God. It's standing right in front of him. They're talking, right? He's right there. To know the love of God is to know Christ. And it begins with God. I don't know where I'm at in my notes, by the way. Um, First John's coming up. <laughs> to love the Lord your God with all, with all, with everything. The first command, to love him. The greatest command. And it, again, that should appeal to everyone. Because everyone desires to be loved. Everyone desires to participate in love. Right? But it begins with bowing our will to God. To, to saying, I'll let you love me. <laughs> right? It's just the pride needs to melt down. The, the, whatever it is, the self-willed nature that's at enmity with God needs to re re stop resisting. Stop resisting. The gospel is all about the love of God. And that's why I, I marvel at times. I'm like, why would not everyone receive the gospel? So much deception, such a thick oppression about it all. The scribe responds so well. Now, love being... You know, the rabbis attempted to formulate a basis, uh, you know, by which they could have an understanding of the law. You know, they could categorize. These are temple laws. These are civil laws. These are Sabbath laws. And so they're, they're studying the law of God continuously. And of course, they're going to analyze and synthesize and resynthesize and try to understand it all, right? So what heading can we place over it? Think about the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, Two ta tables or tablets or stone tablets, right? Written on them the Ten Commandments. Given at Mount Sinai. Here's God's law. Now think about it. The first is going to easily be fulfilled with love God. If you love God, you're not going to create little idols and bow to them. That's not love of God. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to stab him. You know, you're not going to steal from him. You're not going to commit adultery and so forth. So loving God will fulfill the first tablet Loving your neighbor will fulfill the second tablet by default. You'll fulfill it. If you walk in love, you will do the will of God. Isn't that awesome? So love is the law. And, and it wasn't these little laws where they would try to trap Jesus and he'd say, look, if your neighbor's donkey's in a ditch, you go help it. Because that's, that's loving, right? Oh, but the law says, you know, you cannot work. And so it's like, oh my goodness. It was the Sabbath, you know? made so that man can serve the Sabbath? Or was the Sabbath made to serve man, to help man out? And so love is, is that greatest command. It's, it's God's law over the universe. And that's why there's so much ugliness in the world, because there's a rebellion from God. Why is there evil in the world? Because man rebels from God who's love, and man doesn't love each other, therefore. That's really it, Right? Look at these verses, 1 John 5, 1 to 3. I just pulled out a few verses for you. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Oh, 365 no's a year <laughs> or whatever, right? Like, actually, it's every day, but <laughs> it's like, wow, that's so burdensome. His commands aren't burdensome. Love is not burdensome. It's liberating because it liberates us from selfishness. Love liberates us. It's totally liberating. You should know the truth, and the truth sets you free. Liberates us from, from living <laughs> under such a curse. And the CSB, 1 John 5, 3 says, for this is what the love of, for God is. This is what love for God is, excuse me. To keep his commands. His commands are not a burden. Loving God, this is what it looks like. Uh, John 14, 21. Whoever keeps my commands, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. My Father will love him and manifest or reveal himself to him. You want to know God more? Start walking in love. 
receive his love and walk in his love toward others and toward him. And, and God will reveal himself more to you. You will grow in relationship. Imagine that. Love building a relationship? Yeah. <laughs> Works with us in God. Works with us in anyone. Galatians 5, 13 to 14 in the uh, NLT here. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. We've been set free from the bonds of sin, right? And we're set free from, from a, a law works based righteousness. So instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command to love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law can be summed up in this one command love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, this book is about God from beginning to end and his plan to redeem mankind, creating mankind, all the wonderful things he's done. What's God want mankind to do? Love. What? That's it? That's this law. Now, it, be, it gains definition, as we'll talk about some, some distinctions to it for sure. Oh my goodness, I didn't print all my notes. That's okay. We'll wing it today. Um, <laughs> I'm missing a whole page right now. Romans 13, 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You think the New Testament guys got this? They got it, man. They got it. And James, in the book of James, calls love, uh, your loving your neighbor, he calls it the royal law. This is, this is the royal law. I love that. Royal. It's primary. It's above the rest. It's the king or queen of the laws. It's first. It's utmost in principle and command of mankind. Now, I understand how I can uh, try to obey and love through God's law. You know, and it's like in Psalms, there's always, oh, I love your law. I love your law. You know, Psalm 1, and meditate in the law of the Lord day and night. I think I'm like, man, that's, okay. I, I kind of used to not relate to some of those scriptures. You know what I mean? How I love your law. I'm like, I don't know if, I, I mean, like I read it, I study it, it points to Jesus, but do I really love like the laws in Leviticus? Do I love the laws in Deuteronomy? I'm not sure I love the law. You know, like it was just a bit unrelatable. But now I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I can, I can shout that. I love your law because his law is to love. Now I can understand how someone who's pursuing God starts to understand that. I, I love God's law. What a great law, really. Can you come up with a better one? <laughs> this is the greatest. That God's law is love? Man, it's incredible. And I would think the principal law would be the thing that is most important to the ruler. Of course it is, right? You come into a country, what is, this, what is the king's number one law? What is the, number, the most important thing to this ruler? Now, isn't that awesome? The most important thing to God is to love? What's that tell us about him? That's amazing. That is so wonderful. The most important thing to God, the most important thing that you can do and the way to live is to love God and to love your neighbor. By the way, you can't love your neighbor without loving God. I think we'll get into that next week. Not only because of the missing notes, but just because it's, it's too much right now. So we will talk more about love your neighbor as yourself. It's so great. You know, it, it just, it's amazing. And I do think that's interesting. He didn't command first, praise him, honor him, glorify him. No, love him. Love him. Love him and you will rightly praise him. Love him and you will glorify him with all your being. Love him and, and you will honor him, right? It's going to come out of the heart. God wants a relationship right? And, and when he reveals himself, I mean, it's going to be automatic, all that glory, all that praise. It's going to burst out of people's mouths, right? People are going to be uh, accusing him, you know, the long line of questions and complaints or something like that at the complaint bureau of heaven. It's not going to be there or whatever. But love, again, it's going to come from the heart. It's going to be amazing. And some distinctions are given there to show what it looks like to love God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. 
So with your, with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, with your strength. This command is it's repeated in the scriptures in different ways. Sometimes leaving out one of those words. Maybe it's going to say heart, uh, mind, and, or heart and mind are interchangeable in some places, actually. So with all your heart, soul, and strength, it's, it's written different ways. But by the way, the purpose isn't to give like a, uh, a psychology or physiology or whatever you want to call it, uh, the breakdown of what makes up a human. That's not the intention of the scripture here. What's the intention of the scripture? It's to show us that we are to love God with all that we are, everything, our whole being, leaving nothing out. With all that we are, with every part of who we are, we are to love God with, with the whole of who we are. By the way, it's with the whole faculty of all that you are in each faculty. It says with all your heart or with your whole heart, with all your soul. It's very emphatic. So with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind, with your whole strength. That's everything. Leaving nothing out at all. And it's common to think that love comes from the heart, I think. Where's love come from? It comes from the heart. Well, yes, it does. But it also comes from the mind. You can love God with all your intellect. This is awesome. This like breaks into things maybe you've never thought of before. That's why it was like wowing me all week. Um, loving God with all your mind. And I, I thought, okay, yeah, love, loving God with all your strength, the things I do, right? You know, the way I, I use the strength I have, the body I've got provide for my family or to enjoy some time with a child or whatever it is, right? But loving God with, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, just everything, it's just, it's just incredible. You know, we can love God with more than this one select area. And I, that's why you want to get a definition of love. Love is such a confusing thing, you know. Well, may God help us right? You want to know what love is? Let's start reading our word. Let's start looking at Jesus. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated the love toward us in this, right? That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has demonstrated love. What it looks like with a whole heart, with a whole mind, with a whole soul, with a whole strength, Jesus. He has so demonstrated love in every aspect of who he is. God did not withhold loving us. He did not withhold himself. And love will always put that risk out there. Because in return, how has man treated him? Spit on him? They're going to mock him? I mean, a few days after he says this, the command of God is to love, what are they going to do to him who is incarnate love for mankind? This is man's response. So if you step out in love, watch out. <laughs> But you know what love does? Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and it does not fail. If, it, if love sets out, it doesn't fail. You won't fail. You will not lose. Oh yeah, I will. I'll no, you won't. In the end, you won't lose. God will see to it that all actions of love, all thoughts of love, all love that comes from the heart and the soul, in the end, our eternal works that are going to be blessed by our king of love. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we have going here. Like God is so awesome that this is his command. Lord, we thank you as we're going to take communion now and uh, worship you. We thank you, Jesus, that your command is to love. God, it's just, uh, I just pray that you'd be speaking to every heart throughout this week on this theme. And that, Lord, as we revisit it next Sunday, you'd prepare our hearts to um, just be more receptive to how we so need your Holy Spirit to fill us with love, how we so need to first respond to the love you have for us, to fill our hearts in every area with love so that we can be freed. And with the freedom that you've loved us, Lord, we want to respond and be filled so that we can become more like our Father in heaven. We can be children who become like our heavenly father our parent lord we want to love and and we confess the need 
And Lord, as, as we take communion, we just want to recognize how much you've loved us. That you initiated, Lord, to those who sat in darkness. You initiated to those who were at animosity with you. You initiated. And Lord, we want to first receive the love you have for us, and we want to respond to that. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us with all that you are. Thank you for not withholding that. We thank you that you, you command something that is of your very nature and it is so important to you. We thank you that it fulfills all law. We thank you that the world would be a perfect place, literally, if this was followed. And we thank you that when you return, Lord Jesus, you are going to rule and, and uphold the law. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you're transforming our hearts. And God, I just, I think about it, that the moment that we enter into glory and we are before your throne, I, I believe at that moment, Lord, all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my being, Lord, will at that moment be filled with a full capacity with nothing but love for you. Lord, I'm going to be freed from everything that inhibits me from loving you. Lord, I can't wait for that moment. So God, just bear with us. Continue loving us, Lord, unconditionally because we need it. Continue being faithful to us, Lord, compassionate to us. And Lord, increase our love. Increase our faith that you can pour into us something that is not natural to our old ways and our selfish ways, Lord. So God, free us and, and continue the work that you began in our lives of transforming us from glory to glory to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.